Well, good evening, church. We're happy to see all your faces this evening. Um, we would just invite you to worship along with us tonight. Just give it all over to God. So we've had to do <laughs> tonight. So just worship with us. Amen. All your promises. 
we praise you. You are worthy of our worship. Would you lead us in the way everlasting? Would you work in our hearts, God? We know that you're here. Let's sing together. You are
adore you, Jesus. We lift your name up, knowing that all things are through you and by you and for you, God. You hold all things together. We thank you for this time that we get to sing your praises as the church, Lord. We thank you that we get to lift your name up and glorify you, God. Thank you for how you worked in this time. Thank you for your faithfulness. Thank you that all your promises are yes and amen. We give you the rest of this night. In Jesus' name we pray. All God's people said, amen. You guys may be seated. Good evening. I missed you guys last Wednesday. Did you miss being here? There was a pause there. <laughs> But good to be back here, our Wednesday night service, and uh, just to be fellowshipping and filled. Of course, this place was filled last Wednesday with kids, right? Some of you were here. Raise your hand if you were here. A few of you. But it's good to be back in God's word, and um, we're going to continue our time of worship as we pray for uh, the offering. So would you bow as we pray? Father, we are just so grateful to be here tonight. Anytime that we're together, it's great that we can just sing, raise our voices to you and sing praise. And you are worthy of our praise, and we are so grateful to be here. And uh, Lord, we just want to give back now just a portion of what you give us. You give us so much. Every breath that we have comes from you. Our salvation is from you through your son, Jesus Christ. And Lord, would you take whatever we give, however we give it, multiply it, use it, and expand your kingdom so that others may rejoice in your goodness. And so we give it all to you, in Jesus' name, amen. So just a few quick announcements. So um, this Saturday is our time of our men's breakfast, so it seems like we just had it, but uh, here we are again, the first Saturday of every month. So 8 a.m. for you guys, come hungry, 8 a.m. So we're going to eat, we're going to fellowship, we're going to explore God's word, and just uh, share with one another. It's going to be a great time together. So I would just encourage you to invite a friend to come on out and participate in that. And so you can mow the lawn later. Just tell them that Pastor Mike said you can do that later on. And uh, come on in and, and to have a great time together. Also, uh, starting next Tuesday at 7 p.m., we are beginning our grief share program. So that's going to begin next week. And so if you have lost a loved one or a dear friend and you're just in that mode where you need just encouragement, a small group of people who have been where you're at or maybe going through the same thing that you're going through, this is a great opportunity for you to really connect with other people that can walk with you through this. So Grief Share is the program. Also, um, this coming Sunday is our Welcome to LT event. So if you want to know more about Living Truth, I'll just ask you a couple of questions. Um, do you know Living Truth's history? Do you know what it believes? Do you know the names of all the elders of Living Truth? Do you know um, what the purpose of the local church is? And do you know if there's a biblical basis for church membership? And if you're curious, you can come on out and get those questions answered or maybe other questions as well. So that is going to be at 8.30 this coming Sunday. Uh, you can sign up and uh, participate in that, and it will be a great time that you can find out all that information and even more. And then finally, just a couple days remaining for women who are interested in signing up for the women's retreat. That is going to be next Friday through Sunday, so that's right around the corner. But uh, I asked Shannon Renfrey, is there still a few openings? She said, just a few, and Friday is the deadline. So if you're Riding the fence, maybe you're thinking you might want to register for that. you just got a couple days left to do that. So it's going to be a great time uh, up in the mountains with other women, and uh, you can be blessed by that. So uh, don't wait too long because the seats are filling up very quickly. All that is on the, uh, in our bulletin, which can be shown on our website, as well as our Living Truth app. So if you want to sign up for any of these events or find out more, it's all in the bulletin, which is on the website in the app. So all that information is available to you. So right now, as Pastor Michael comes up, why don't you stand and say hi to your neighbor in front of you, behind you, or uh, give him a holy hug, and we'll have him come up.
All right, good evening, everybody. Welcome to our Wednesday night. You guys are all kind of far back, but that's all right. Stay where you are. <laughs> We're in the book of Exodus, the second book of your Bible tonight, chapter 30. We're going to look at the holy anointing oil in the book of Exodus. We've been moving verse by verse through the book, and we're glad you're here tonight to join us. So open up to the book of Exodus. As you do so, I would like to take a moment just to acknowledge the passing of Vin Scully, um, famous uh, Dodger announcer, going back 67 years uh, announcing Dodger games. I think anybody who's been a baseball fan in Southern California or even anywhere in the country um, knows of Vin Scully. And he uh, really was a uh, master um, uh, broadcaster, I guess is the way you would say it. Uh, actually broadcasted a World Series at the age of 25. He started very young. It's hard to imagine doing anything for 67 years. But he was actually the Dodgers announcer from Brooklyn, then to L.A. when the team moved in the 50s. And I am a huge Dodger fan, and I had a chance to go to a batting practice uh, through a connection we had here at, in the church and uh, go down on, at Dodger Stadium and watch the actual pregame BP. And uh, a car pulled up, and sure enough, it was Vin Scully was someone uh, who was walking him into an interview. And you kind of wonder, you know, how people are. You, you see them on TV or whatever, and you kind of wonder what their personality might be like. But uh, he, we said, hey, that's Vin Scully, and we were a little starstruck. And he went, howdy, folks, nice to see you. And he wanted to start coming our way, but the person who was with him whisked him away. I think he was late for an interview. But I found out last night, as people were uh, kind of just talking about his lifetime, that he always took time for people, very much a gentleman, seemed to be a believer from everything that I could see in Vin. Uh, and it is a hard thing to see him pass and... Even when he retired a few years back, it was a hard transition for all of us who grew up uh, listening to that great voice uh, about Dodger baseball. But anyway, so if Tommy Lasorda is right and the great Dodger in the sky welcomed Vin Scully home, and you guys do believe that God is a Dodger fan, do you not? I mean, I mean the color of Yahweh is royal blue. You guys got to know this. Anyway, I know that's some deep theology to open up, but... Uh, I do uh, mourn his passing because I, I do believe that he is a, a man that was a true gentleman, and uh, we're not seeing a whole lot of those these days. So uh, he was definitely a treasure. And um, anyway, just wanted to give him some honor. We are looking at the holy anointing oil in the book of Exodus, chapter 30. We're going to pick up the text in verse 22. And if you're able to stand with us, would you stand for the reading of the Word of God? For those of you who have joined us via live stream, welcome. Uh, Exodus 30, verse 22, the holy anointing oil. It reads this way. Moreover, the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Take also for yourselves the finest of spices, of flowing myrrh, 500 shekels, and of fragrant cinnamon, half as much, 250, and of fragrant cane, 250, Exodus 30, 24. And of Cassia, 500, according to the shekel of the sanctuary and of, a olive, and of olive oil, a hin. You shall make of these a holy anointing oil, a perfume mixture, the work of a perfumer. It shall be a holy anointing oil. With it, you shall anoint the tent of meeting and the ark of the testimony the table and all its utensils, and the lampstand and its utensils, and the altar of incense, the altar of burnt offering, offering and all its utensils, and the laver and its stand. You shall also consecrate them, they, that they may be most holy. Whatever touches them shall be holy. You shall anoint Aaron and his sons and consecrate them, that they may minister as priests to me. You shall speak to the sons of Israel, saying, This shall be a holy anointing oil to me throughout your generations. It shall not be poured on anyone's body, nor shall you make any like it in the same proportions. It is holy, and it shall be holy to you. Whoever shall mix any like it, or whoever puts any of it on a layman, shall be cut off from his people. 
This is the word of the Lord. Amen. You can have a seat. Father, thank you for the living word of God and for this little section on holy anointing oil. Uh, some of the first mentions in the Bible are in the book of Exodus about this uh, mixture and what it was used for. And it is an intriguing concept to us, Lord, because we do see it mentioned in the New Testament as well. And we do want to have an understanding of what the anointing oil is, how it was applied, and what it means to us in our day. What does it symbolize? What does it point to? And how are we to make application, understand it, and then to apply it? So tonight, Lord, we need the illumination of your Holy Spirit, and we've got it because your Holy Spirit lives within us. We are the temple of the Holy Spirit. We have the anointing right now. 1 John 2.20 says we have the anointing, and we can understand truth because you live in us. We also benefit from teachers, Lord, and thank you for all of those who teach us, faithful pastors and Bible study leaders and so many others who pour over the Word of God in order to cut it straight and give us a good understanding of what's right and true. You are the God of truth. Lead us into all truth tonight. In Jesus' name and all God's people said, amen. Well, the word anointing uh, gets thrown around a little bit in Christian circles, and you may have wondered about it. Um, the word anointing is found in five verses in the New Testament. If you're taking notes tonight, it's found in Mark 6.13, Luke 7.38, James 5.14, that's the famous passage about anointing the sick with oil in the name of the Lord, 1 John 2.20 and 27. I'll give it to you one more time. The verses are Mark 6.13, Luke 7.38, James 5.14, and 1 John 2.20 and 27. Now, if you've been around the church for any length of time, you've probably heard about the concept of anointing. And perhaps you came from a background where people anointed everything. And when I say anointing, I'm talking about the sprinkling of a liquid oil or the smearing of oil on something. It could be that you maybe you've watched someone anoint their house or a room or uh, you've seen someone who was sick anointed with oil in the name of the Lord. This was all new to me when I became a Christian. I had heard about some of the concepts of anointing, and I had come from a Roman Catholic background where there was something called the divine unction or the, the priest would uh, anoint a person who was about to die. And that was part of the process, you know, when someone was about to leave this world. And uh, I think the Roman Catholic Church has said that they got that from James chapter 5. But James chapter 5 is not, not about people leaving the world. It's about trying to keep them in the world by praying for their healing. Amen? So that's kind of an interesting uh, twist on the passage. But nevertheless, um, we have seen oil used in, in many different settings. Maybe you've never experienced that before. Uh, maybe you have been. Maybe personally someone anointed you with oil. Typically, when this happens, at least in an evangelical context, we will take anointing oil. I happen to have some in my pocket right here. And we'll take a dab of it and we'll put a cross on someone's forehead. Uh, there's some indication in the Bible that um, the, the letter Tav was placed on foreheads to mark certain individuals. So we mark people with the cross and then we pray over them. And the question would become, when someone gets anointed with some oil like this, what is the purpose for that? What precedent do we have for it? Are we just thinking that it has some magical power? Or, you know, uh, some people think that, you know, there's a sacramental value. What do you mean by that, Pastor Michael? That perhaps when the oil is applied, there's a power invested into the oil, just like maybe in Roman Catholic circles, someone would believe that uh, when the priest prays over the Mass, uh, he can somehow bring down the spirit or bring down the power of God and take normal elements like a wafer or a cup of wine and somehow they would be trans, in, in Catholic circles, literally transubstantiated or transformed from normal food and drink into the body and blood and divinity of Christ. Literally, I'm quoting them when I 
share that with you. That's what they believe at the consecration of, a ma of the Mass. These normal uh, bread and, and wine become changed. They transubstantiate into the literal body, blood, and divinity of Christ. And when you dig down a little bit on that, they'll say, well, it's a bit of a mystery. We don't know how it all works, but that's what they teach, and they pick that up from John chapter 6. And so what does the Bible teach about these kinds of things? How can we ground ourselves in what the Bible says and not do what it doesn't say or make some assumptions? I'm going to come back to that thought, but the first thing I'm going to give you is some headings. The first heading is the mixture of the oil. This is Exodus 30, 22 through 25. So the Lord speaks to Moses. If, you're like, if you like writing headings in your Bible or you're taking notes, the mixture, or you could call this the proprietary mixture, because it's not to be used for any other purposes. This is unique and uh, exclusive. And the Lord speaks to Moses. He's up on the mountain receiving instructions uh, for all the pieces of the tabernacle. We've been studying that. And he says, take also for yourself the finest of spices, 23, of flowing, or the NIV says liquid myrrh, 500 shekels, uh, of fragrant cinnamon, half as much, that would be 250, 250, and of fragrant cane, 250, and of cassia, 500, according to the shekel of the sanctuary. So that's the way that the, the weight would be determined. And notice, uh, olive, uh, and of olive oil, a uh, hin, which is uh, about a gallon. And you shall make of these, that is, of these elements, a sacred anointing oil, or an anointing oil, New American Standard, a perfume mixture, the NIV calls it a fragrant blend, the work of a perfumer. We're going to come back to that concept in a little bit. It shall be a holy anointing oil. So just a few things that you can uh, take note of here. In the ancient world, oil was used to keep someone clean, and it was actually used as a bug repellent. When David wrote Psalm 23, and he said, you anoint my head with oil, and then he said, my cup overflows. Well, the anointing of a sheep with oil was literally used as bug repellent by a shepherd. And so oil in the ancient world was used medicinally for healing of different parts of the body, and it was used as bug repellent, <laughs> which is kind of interesting. Just on a practical note, if you're working in a temple, tabernacle setting with animals and death, and all that we've studied so far might not be a bad idea. Some of you spray that bug repellent uh, on yourselves. If you go out, you know, when the sun is going down, those mosquitoes can be pretty nasty, right? And uh, so in the ancient world, this, this was one use. And when oil was applied in the ancient world, like let's just think of the time of Moses leading all the way up to the time of Christ, there was this idea that oil had some practical medicinal value. And so uh, that's one way to understand this, but it's much deeper than that. Now, some of the elements you can see <clears throat> in the passage included myrrh. Um, myrrh is mentioned in the Song of Solomon, chapter 1, verse 13, chapter 3, verse 6, and many other places. Pope, the commentator, describes myrrh as an aromatic gum which exudes from cracks in the bark of a balsa medendrum myrrha, which grows in Arabia, Abyss Abyssinia, and India. So this is one of the elements. Jesus, when the uh, wise men came to him, they presented him with gifts of gold, frankincense, and myrrh. So in the Song of Solomon, when you see myrrh mentioned, it's kind of like a perfume. It's, it's, a, it's a mixture of perfume to smell nice. And we have studied that God seems to enjoy good smells. Amen? In fact, he mentions often when a sacrifice is given, it is a sweet smelling aroma to him. And we studied Philippians 4, that when the Philippian church had given an offering to Paul for his ministry, it became a sweet smelling aroma to God. So God enjoys those smells. 
And uh, here we have another example of it when the priests are going in and they're working hard on sacrifices and all of that. They go through the washing at the laver, remember? And they get anointed, they put on the proper garments, and then they make their way into the holy place, etc. And so this is part of the preparation for the priest. They get anointed. Um, just a, a kind of a breaking down of the word. The flowing myrrh, myrrh is more, that's the word for myrrh and doror, and it has the idea of liberty or freedom. Interestingly enough, this uh, end of the word, flowing myrrh, is the idea. Um, you can think of like freedom here. The flow of freedom is the idea here of the first ingredient. Is used in the Pentateuch in Leviticus 25.10, for liberty or release in the year of jubilee, which is kind of interesting. Now, the Messiah, Jesus, in Isaiah 61, he says these words. The Lord, the Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has, remember, anointed me. And then he begins to speak of the things that he's anointed the Messiah to do to proclaim liberty, that's part of the idea of the flowing myrrh, is liberty to the captive. So the anointed one is the Messiah who through his preaching ministry and the way he touched people through the power of the Spirit, which is the symbolism we'll get to in a moment, touched people to bring freedom to them, deliverance to them by the power of God. And the priests are set aside as an ultimate picture of the ultimate priest. The high priest was Aaron, but he died, and all the high priests after him died. Jesus became the ultimate high priest, anointed by the power of the Holy Spirit, and he went around, Acts 10, 38, doing good. So this picture carries all the way over to the Messiah. The Messiah, um, in the Hebrew word, is anointed one is Messiah. So if you're taking notes, the anointed one is Messiah in Hebrew, and in Greek it's the what? The Christ. That's Christos in Greek. So just so you got it, the Hebrew word for the anointed one is Messiah. The Greek word for the anointed one is Christ. So when you hear Jesus is called Jesus Christ, technically that means Jesus the Christ. Jesus, the Messiah. Christ is not his last name, okay? They didn't go by last names back in the day. He was just known as the son of Joseph or the carpenter's son. You would be associated by your parents or parents or where you came from. He was known as Jesus of Nazareth, right? But Christ is who he is. He is Messiah, so Jesus was the name given to him at his birth or when he was eight days old. But Christ is who he is. He is the anointed one. And you know, when you study your Bible, <clears throat> you will see, for example, Samuel anointed um, Saul as the first king of Israel. And then he anointed David before he ever took the office. David was anointed. And you may be asking, well, what does that look like when someone was anointed? Well, they would literally pour oil on their head. I don't know how much oil they would pour, but there's an image of this in Psalm 133. And with that in mind, just hold your place in Exodus. Turn over to Psalm 133. <clears throat> just three verses here. But it's worth looking at because it's a beautiful picture of the anointing and some implications of the anointing for us today. Take a look. It says, Psalm 133, David writing, Behold, how good and how pleasant it is for brothers or brethren to dwell together in unity. It, that is the unity, is like the precious, what? Oil upon the head. Now notice this. Coming down upon the beard, even Aaron's beard. Now that's the first high priest and he was anointed as we're going to see here in our chapter, coming down, notice, upon the edge of his robes. Now, as I was studying um, the mixture of the anointing oil, it was kind of interesting because the amount that 
was produced from the measurements here was just under 40 pounds. I think to be precise, it's 38 pounds of liquid. So that's a lot of weight. That's a lot of oil, right? And so it would appear from the description of Psalm 133 that when they anointed, it wasn't just simply a little dab will do you. It was rather a pouring uh, out of the oil. And when we think about the symbolism, and the symbolism is the power of the Holy Spirit in our lives, we see images in the Bible of this idea of pouring out. Uh, we want the overflow. We want it to be rivers of living water, torrents, amen, flowing in and out of our lives. And so take a look. It says, this unity, which is the uh, first verse, is like the dew of Hermon, Mount Hermon, where the waters flow into northern Israel, coming down upon the mountains of Zion. For there the Lord commanded the blessing, notice, life forever. Amen? And so unity is a byproduct of the Holy Spirit working in our lives. Back to Exodus chapter 30. And when we're not unified... It's the byproduct of the flesh. Amen? Now, I'm not talking about unity for unity's sake here. You all know that. I'm talking about, I'm not talking about someone's out to lunch and you got to be unified and we're all just going to sing kumbaya around the fire. I'm talking about true unity around the fact that we belong to the true God. That, when we're walking in the Spirit, unity will be the uh, outgrowth of that. And so this is a, just a, a verse to write down. Psalm 45, verse 8. In the setting of the psalm, it's about the Messiah. It says, all your garments are fragrant with myrrh and aloes and cassia. Out of ivory palaces, stringed instruments have made you glad. Psalm 45, verse 8. So just a little bit more of the composition. The oils... Composition is two parts liquid myrrh, one part each of cinnamon and cane, two parts cassia, with olive oil added. That's verses 23 and 24 of Exodus 30. Then there's a hint of olive oil, which is uh, about a gallon in modern measurement. So the quantity of 1,500 shekels of fragrance, 500 of myrrh, 250 of cinnamon, 250 of cane, and 500 of cassia, about just under 40 pounds modern measurement. In general, one writer says, perfumes are made by forcing essences of fragrant materials into oil rather than simply by adding up or otherwise powdered plant material to oil in order to make the mixture. So the special blend, says Riken, of spices featured expensive ingredients from all over the world, liquid myrrh, cinnamon bark, other rare imports from India, Arabia, and Lebanon. These fine ingredients were carefully distilled in olive oil, which served as a base for the sacred mixture. And so that was the, the actual stuff, you could say, the, the mixture itself, this fragrant, special, holy anointing oil. Now, the next part, the mixture, number one, number two in your notes, the application. What do you do with it? In verse 26 of Exodus 30, it reads this way. With it, you shall anoint, and you're going to see seven things. Seven is the number of completion or perfection. Take a look. Verse 26. With it, you shall anoint the tent of meeting. That's the tabernacle itself. Two, the ark of the testimony. That's the ark of the covenant. The one thing behind the veil. Three, the table of showbread. I added showbread, but... It says the table, but we've already studied this as well, and all its utensils. Four, the menorah or the lampstand and its utensils. Five, the altar of incense, which we've studied. Six, the altar of burnt offering. You can see that we're moving uh, from the inner holy place, holy of holies, out to the outer court and all its utensils. And then the laver, the wash basin and its stand, you shall also consecrate them that they may be most holy. 
Whatever touches them shall be holy. It doesn't mean that when you touch them, you get holy. It means that if you're going to touch them, you better be holy. You better be set apart before you go in and do any of this stuff. And of course, this is addressing the priest. Seven things. You take this holy mixture and here's how you apply it. And seven is what we have studied now. The tabernacle, the ark. The tabernacle is the tent itself, the ark, the table of showbread, the lampstand of the menorah, the altar of incense, uh, representing prayer, the altar of burnt offering where all the sacrifices happen, and the wash laver and its stand. <clears throat> and you consecrate each of these things. So the tabernacle and everything in it, everything we've studied so far, gets anointed. Now, just hold a place in Exodus just for a moment. Flip over to Leviticus, the very next book. Here's one way we see it applied. Leviticus chapter 8. Leviticus 8. We're going to read verses 10 through 12. And here's what it says. Moses then took the anointing oil, Leviticus 8.10, and anointed the tabernacle and all that was in it and consecrated them. And he sprinkled some of it on the altar seven times, Leviticus 8.11, and anointed the altar and its utensils and the basin and its stand to consecrate them. Then he poured some of the anointing oil on Aaron's head and anointed him to consecrate him. So this anointing, when you turn back to Exodus 30 and you think about what the priests have gone through, they've, we've seen their clothing, so they get special vestments. The high priest has special clothing that he wears. He has the turban, which says, holy to the Lord. He's totally set apart. And then he gets anointed. So we put on the Lord Jesus Christ. We put on the, the new man, the armor of God, if you will. But we still need the power of God. Now, I think the power of God obviously comes to us through the putting on the, of the armor of God. And I don't want to kind of falsely slice and dice this. But here's the point. We need the power of the Holy Spirit in our lives. And the Spirit lives in us. He's already resident in believers. So then what is it that is the key to unlocking this power? I will tell you one thing that I know. It's called yielding. It's called yielding to that power. So if you want the power of God in your life, you must yield to it. You ask for it, you lean into it, you yield to it. You allow God to flow through you. You become a vessel fit for the master's use. Now I'll tell you this. I'm a man, flesh and blood. I'm a human just like you guys. But there have been moments in my life when I have sensed a divine rush of power Oftentimes when I'm preaching, sometimes when I'm in places where I feel a bit like I'm in, you know, the lion's den. I remember I was telling people a story. I was a young pastor and I had gone to this memorial service and I was going to preach to this group and I knew nobody. And I was walking in there and I didn't know what to expect. And there was a guy playing the bagpipes outside and he was a brother in the Lord and we encouraged each other. And he stood outside because of the noise and whatever. And so I remember I went in there and, you know, there's always a, some natural nerves and fear and trepidation in my humanity, right? So it causes me just to pray and lean into the Lord. And so I remember walking out of there and he said, boy, were you giving it to those people in there? And I was like, praise the Lord, I think. <laughs> but what he meant was the word was sounding forth with power. This is what we need. The kingdom of God coming with power. It's not that... The vessel is anything, right? It's God's power. So we see the priest here mentioned in the next couple of verses. Notice, you shall anoint. So we have the seven things within the tabernacle that were anointed. You could call them furnishings, if you will. In verse 30 of Exodus 30, it says, You shall anoint Aaron and his sons and consecrate them that they may minister as priests to me. If you just look back in the previous chapter, we've already seen a mention of the anointing of the priest. Look at 29.7. It says, Then you shall take the anointing oil and pour it on his head and anoint him, 
And there we're dealing with Aaron as the high priest. And then go all the way down to verse 21. Notice this mixture. Then you shall take some of the blood that is on the altar and some of the anointing oil and sprinkle it on Aaron and on his garments and on his sons. They're the priests that will serve as well. On his son's garments with him so that so he and his garment shall be, here's that word again, consecrated, set apart, as well as his sons and his son's garments with him. So the, the priests also get anointed and the picture rounds out in terms of what it is that is going on with this anointing oil and how it is applied. Let me just give you a couple other thoughts in the chapter um, and then we'll, we'll turn to a few more and we'll be done. So in Exodus chapter 30, notice it says this. It talks about uh, the anointing of the sons. And then it says, you shall speak, look at 31, Exodus 30, to the sons of Israel, this shall be a holy anointing oil to me throughout your generation. So it was to, to go on. They were to keep doing this. It shall not be poured on anyone's body, nor, and I think this speaks to the lay person now, a non-priest, nor shall you make any like it in the same proportions. Don't start a business with this special mixture. Hey, got it from Exodus 30, selling it online, $29.99. But wait, there's more. If you order now, two bottles of anointing oil will come to you straight from the hills of Israel, from Mount Zion, for the special introductory price of... They're always very easy payments because you're making them and I'm receiving them. So they're easy payments, right? Don't do that. Don't take what is consecrated in a special context and put it out there in a different setting. Now, what does this mean to us? Well, we're not to take the holy things of God and turn them into a marketing ploy or use them for our own personal gain. Give me this gift. Hey, I'll give you money so I too can lay my hands on whomever I like and they'll get the spirit too. Uh, uh, uh. May your money perish with you because you thought you could buy the gift of God with money. No, no, no. You have no part in this ministry, Peter says. And so there's a warning and if you have been writing the headings, we have the mixture, the application, and the warning. Notice, it shall not be poured on anyone's body, 32, nor shall you make any like it in the same proportions. It is holy. It shall be holy to you. Whoever shall mix any like it, whoever puts any of it on a layman, a non-priest, shall be cut off from his people. If you read on this, um, scholars will say cut off from his people could include ideas of excommunication, judgment on the individual or future generations or death. So not something you want to do, right? You don't want to mess with holy things, nor do you want to fake holy things. So let me just say a word about that. Some of you have seen in, in our country so-called revivals. How we all long for a genuine revival in seeing and witnessing and experiencing the Holy Spirit. Amen? We all desire that. But I think we've seen some so-called revivals that have not reflected who God is. And it's been everything from people barking like dogs, howling like they were in a haunted house, and flopping around like fish. And I'm just not convinced that that's what the Spirit of God is doing. I think when you sense what the Spirit of God is doing, there's going to be a different type of manifestation. And it's going to bring Him glory. It's not going to be about performance. It's not going to be about hyper-emotion. You're going to sense the presence of God, the truth of God, the power of God manifesting itself. And it's going to ring true. I want to show you just a, a verse that relates to that. It's in all the way in 1 John. So you're going to go all the way almost to Revelation. Let me just show you something that John says. John was dealing with some early forms of Gnosticism, which developed into a heresy. 
the end or early part, end, end of the first century, early part of the second. And in chapter 2, verse 20, he's talking about the spirit of Antichrist and being able to discern. And do you know that the anointing, if you want to talk about one of the places, remember I told you there's five New Testament uh, passages at the beginning that many of you wrote down? Here's the last two of them. This is something very important to put in your pocket. The anointing, one of five passages in the New Testament, will manifest itself in your life with one word, discernment. Discernment. Do you all know what that means? That means that you'll be able to know the difference between truth and error, a true gospel and a false gospel, and antichrist and the true Christ. Everybody with me? If you want to know what the New Testament teaches about the concept of anointing, one bedrock thing, because I'm just going to read the verse to you and then you'll know it's true, <laughs> is discernment. So take a look. 1 John 2, 20. But you have an anointing from the Holy One and you all know. I've not written to you because you do not know the truth, but because you know it, you do know it, and because no lie is of the truth. Keep reading. Who is a liar? But the one who denies that Jesus is the Christ, this is Antichrist, the Antichrist, the one who denies the Father and the Son. Keep reading. Whoever denies the Son, Jesus, does not have the Father. The one who confesses the Son has the Father also. Skip down to verse 27. As for you, the anointing which you receive from him abides in you. It remains, and you have no need for anyone to teach you you, we all need teachers, but I think you get the point. You're going to have an inner discernment because the Spirit lives in you. But, but as His anointing teaches you about all things and is true and is not a lie, notice, and just as it has been taught you, you abide in Him. Now, if you think about 1 John 2.20 and you want to apply anointing to your life, let's just pause here for a quick second. If the anointing of the Holy Spirit, the symbolism from the Old Testament to the New Testament, is the idea of the life of the Spirit in the believing community, the church, one clear manifestation of the anointing is to know the truth and discern truth from error. Wheat from chaff, light from darkness. And if you see a group of people listening to her heretical doctrine, heresy, and applauding, they ain't got the anointing. <laughs> now, sometimes people will do a little group think or they'll get caught up in the moment. They don't know what they're saying amen to. But my point is simply this. If you're going to have the anointing of God, you will have discernment. Bottom line. All right? Let me show you just one other passage as it relates to this. It's in 2 Corinthians chapter 1. So a little bit back now. 2 Corinthians chapter 1. Paul's talking to the Corinthian church and they had given him a bad time. And they basically were accusing Paul of being wishy-washy in his travel plans. And he'd say one thing and then do another. And Paul says, no, that's, that's not what's going on here. But as God is faithful, 2 Corinthians 1.18 our word to you is not yes and no. I wasn't, I wasn't teetering back and forth. Yes, no, yes and no. For the Son of God, Christ Jesus, who is preached among you, 2 Corinthians 1.19, by us, by me and Silvanus and Timothy, was not yes and no, but is yes in him. For as many are the promises of God in him, they are yes, therefore also through him is our amen to the glory of God through us. Now he who establishes us with you in Christ and anointed us is God, who also sealed us and gave the Spirit in our hearts as a pledge. But I call God as witness to my soul that to spare you I did not come again to Corinth. Now, Paul is saying this. We all, if you look at verse 22, are sealed with the Holy Spirit. 
And we have the Spirit as a pledge. This uh, afternoon, we did a memorial service for a gentleman named Fidel. Fidel in Latin means faithful. It's kind of cool to share that with his family. I'm sure they probably knew it, but it was new to me. Anyway, so I was sharing with the family that when you're born again of the Holy Spirit, there's a word in, in Ephesians. It's the Greek word arhaban. In modern Greek, it means an engagement ring. It's the word used for the Holy Spirit being a pledge of our future inheritance. Here's what God does. When you get saved, when you're born again of the Holy Spirit, God's engagement ring to you, his pledge of your future inheritance, heaven, all the promises of Jesus, yes and amen. Yes and amen. Is heaven real? Yes. Is there a place prepared for you? Yes. Are you going to be with the Lord? Yes. Is death going to die in the resurrection? Yes. Every promise is yes. 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 You say, well, how do I know? People were sitting here today and said, you're preaching about a resurrection, but there's a, a body in a box. What do I do with that? How do I know? Because the Lord's given a pledge. This is the modern Greek word. The pledge is his Holy Spirit. He's given him as a down payment, ensuring our future redemption. How do I know I'm saved? How do I know I'm going to heaven? How do I know these promises are true? Because his spirit bears witness with my spirit that I belong to him. Amen? And so this is how I know. Now you say, well, that's experiential. Well, it's, but it's based on the Bible, the objective truth of God's word. And it's affirmed by God's promises. And then the layer on the cake, the, the frosting, if you will, is his presence, which I think if the presence of God's in your life, you're going to know, right? Don't you guys think you'd know? You should know. If you've been born again of the Holy Spirit, I think you should know. <laughs> Are you saved? I don't know. <laughs> well, you should know. Well, how do you know? Trust Christ. Now, I'm not saying everybody has this, you know, amazing experience where you just float off the ground, but many people will speak of feeling like a weight came off their shoulders etc. So, two final uh, stories. Now I want to transition for a second to the gospel power of our text. Okay, so we've talked about some application in the life of the believer. Now let's talk about the gospel picture. I want to show you two passages and the preacher promises were done after that. Luke 7, but I am a man and I've been known to not keep my word. <laughs> Luke chapter 7. So one happening somewhere in the middle of Jesus' ministry and one at the end will be in Luke and John. The first one, Luke 7, verse 36. It reads this way. Now when one of the Pharisees was requesting Jesus to dine with him, he entered the Pharisee's house and reclined at the table. Luke 7, 37. There was a woman in the city who was a sinner. And when she learned that he was reclining at the table in the Pharisee's house, she brought an alabaster vial of perfume. What struck me in the Exodus passage is that the anointing oil is the work of a perfumer. So it's some sort of fragrant aroma akin to a perfume. So take a look now. So she, she's got this alabaster vial of perfume, which... Jewish women would wear around their neck. It would kind of hang from their neck. And standing behind Jesus at his feet, so the, the way that the Jews would sit at a table, their feet would be out from them. She began to wet his feet with her tears, kept wiping them with her, the hair of her head and kissing his feet. And what was she doing? Anointing them with the perfume. Now here's another mention of the five passages about anointing. Here's another one, I'm, one of them. The one I'm not going to go to is the James 5.14, which talks about anointing for healing. Now, when the Pharisee who had invited Jesus saw this, that that woman was doing what she was doing near his feet, he said to himself, if this man were a prophet, 
He would know who and what sort of person this woman is who is touching him, that she is a sinner, perhaps a prostitute. We don't know for sure. And Jesus answered him. What did he answer? What he was thinking. How inconvenient. You imagine you're thinking something and all of a sudden Jesus calls you out and you're like, what? I I didn't say that out loud. Because Jesus knows a thought before you think it. A word before you speak it. No, you get it. (laughs) And Jesus said, he answered him and said, Simon, I have something to say to you. Now he is the Pharisee. He replied, say it, teacher. A money lender had two debtors and one owed 500 denarii and the other 50. So one owed over a year's worth of wages and one uh, much less. When they were unable to repay, he graciously forgave them both. Which of them will love him more? Simon answered and said, I suppose the one whom he forgave more. And he said to him, You have judged correctly. Turning toward the woman, he said to Simon, Do you see this woman? I entered your house and you gave me no water for my feet, which they should have done. But she has wet my feet with her tears and wiped them with her hair. You gave me no kiss But she, since the time I came in, has not ceased to kiss my feet. And the language here is kiss them over and over and over again. You did not, what? Anoint my head with oil. But she anointed my feet with perfume. For this reason, I say to you, her sins, which are many, have been forgiven. For she loved much. But he who is forgiven little loves little. And then he said to her, Your sins have been forgiven. Those who were reclining at the table with him began to say to themselves, Who is this man that who even forgives sins? And he said to the woman, Your faith has saved you. Literally, go into shalom. Go into peace. Now here's a woman who does for Jesus what the head of the house should have done. And all we can conclude if you turn to John chapter 12 is the following, that she heard his preaching, maybe had an interaction with him along the way. She was, you know, uh, impacted radically by it. She believed. And in order to show gratitude to her Lord, she began to do something radically beautiful and extravagant. She took perfume of high value in an alabaster jar and began to just pour it on him to anoint him. When we studied the priests, the priests uh, were anointed on their head. It ran down. Uh, they, They were anointed on their thumbs and on their feet. It makes me think of what Jesus suffered on the cross. And here a woman is anointing Jesus. And in John chapter 12, this is the last of the passages to look at the gospel picture. We have the following account. This is different from the one we just looked at. Jesus, six days before the Passover, came to Bethany where Lazarus was. He had raised Lazarus from the dead in John 11, whom Jesus had raised from the dead. This is John 12, 2. So they made him a supper there, and Martha was serving, but Lazarus was one of those reclining at the table. If you look at verse 9, this was a party going on. And verse 9 says, A large crowd of the Jews had learned that Jesus was there, and they came not only for Jesus' sake, but that they might see also see Lazarus, a two-for-one ticket, (laughs) who was raised from the dead. Can you imagine the discussion there? What was it like? You, You were dead. You were in the tomb. Four days. What happened? What was on the other side? How many... Newspaper reporters wanted that interview. I mean, people were coming upon the house and so forth. And notice what happens. Mary, that's the sister of Martha, who was always sitting at Jesus' feet, taking in, drinking in the spirit, if you will, took a pound of very costly perfume, something that perhaps was for her own dowry or perhaps her family's inheritance. It was a pure nard, a special mixture, if you will. And she anointed the feet of Jesus. Other accounts say 
his head as well, so the feet in the head, and wiped his feet with her hair. And the house was filled with the fragrance of the perfume. When Moses anoints the holy place in Exodus 40, the temple is called the house of God, and the extravagant beauty of the fragrance moves through the house, the tabernacle, then the temple. And here it moves through this house, which is the house of Simon, the former leper, who who was healed. And so the whole house is filled with this fragrant perfume. It it perhaps would take uh, Jesus and others back to the book of Exodus, the anointing of the priest, the house of God, the tabernacle, the one who had come to tabernacle among us was now being anointed by two women. It seems like the women got it more than the guys did. You want to call it women's intuition? So be it. I believe in it. (laughs) My wife has special radar. For example, she can tell me where my socks are while she's talking on the phone, working on some sewing or whatever she's doing. Third drawer, far right. There's something about the mail I look once, I do not move things around. I expect them to pop out. Can I get a witness? Any other guy? You open the refrigerator. Something good should move toward me. It's only right. (laughs) No, it doesn't work that way. It takes your wife to relocate certain things. It's like sometimes, she's probably watching right now, I'll say, where is that mustard? And she'll come over, move a couple things right here. And I'm like, no, it wasn't there. But you all know denial is only a river in Egypt. So you can't go there. Apparently she has the anointing. (laughs) I do not. Anyway, where was I going with that? So the whole fragrance fills the house. And Judas Iscariot, one of his disciples who was intending to betray him, said, Why was this perfume not sold for 300 denarii and given to the poor people? So righteous sounding was Judas, wasn't he? Hey! What are you doing over there with that perfume? That's a waste! You hear people say, Oh, you, you go to a Bible study on Friday night? Dude! (laughs) What a waste! Yeah, because compared to what you're doing, I'm sure your Friday night's much more productive than mine. And your Saturday morning as well. Anyway. So he did not say this. He said this not because six, he was concerned about the poor, but because he was what? Judas was a thief. And as he had the money box... He used to pilfer what was put into it. He didn't care about the poor. He cared about himself. And Jesus said, leave her alone so that she may keep it for the day of my burial. If you all take a look up at the very first verse of the chapter, it's six days before Jesus is going to die. She's anticipating that moment. The preparation for burial was very big in the Jewish world. For you always have the poor with you. Jesus is just quoting from the law now. You're always going to have poor people, and it's not that he doesn't care about them, but he's saying you need to understand the moment. You don't always have me. You've got about six days. And so this is the beautiful account of this woman, and other gospels tell us that she did what she could And wherever the gospel is proclaimed, the story of what she did will be told. She anointed the anointed one. She got it. And this is the gospel picture. Jesus Christ, the anointed one, came down on a saving mission. Messiah, Christ, comes to fulfill the high priestly imagery. He's greater than Aaron. He's greater than Joshua. He's greater than Moses. He's the greatest one of all, great in God's house. 
And he entered into the more perfect tabernacle in heaven, not by the blood of bulls and goats, but by his own blood to purchase our redemption, to pour out the perfume, if you will, the fragrance of Christ, the power of the Holy Spirit in our lives. Amen? Just bow your heart with me. Father, thank you for these precious folks who have come on this Wednesday night to drink in the beauty of God. Thank you for this precious time of worship. I believe that your spirit works in the anointing ministry as we worship, as we study, as we open our hearts. Now, we have that anointing, we know, and we studied that, but we also know that there's an empowering, there's an overflow, there's be ye kept being filled with the spirit. And I don't understand how all that works, Lord, but I do know this that you say anyone who asks for your spirit, you will give it. Jesus had the spirit without measure. And I believe, Lord, you want to do a fresh work in many lives tonight. You want us to dip in where maybe we've just put our toe in the water. And it's not complicated, Lord. You've already anointed things. Your word, your spirit is in your word. Your, you've anointed worship. All these things, you've just simply set it apart that we can benefit from it and be changed. So Lord, help us with that. Help us to yield to your spirit. We have the anointing, but help us to put on the new man, to put on the mind of Christ and each and every moment to enjoy you, Lord, to enjoy the beauty of fellowship, the beauty of knowing our God the joy of the kingdom. May more of those fruits be ours in full uh, measure, Father. Just keep your heart bowed for a moment. If you have not met Jesus as your Messiah, you've not invited him in as your Savior, why don't you do that right now? Maybe you're not sure right now that you're born again. You can be sure. Because if you ask him into your life, you repent of your sin and you ask him to be king and Lord and savior, he will be faithful to save you right now. You're watching this via live stream. You're not sure you're saved. This is the most important thing you can ever do. And it's not just to get a ticket into heaven. It's not just an insurance policy. It's to know the God that made you, to know the king, to know his kingdom, to be used for his glory, to know the joy and peace of his kingdom. Maybe you've been a prodigal. Maybe it's been a long time since you've dipped into the living waters. I pray that he would refresh your spirit and call you home and that you'll hear his voice. He loves you. And then, Father, for all these precious saints, I pray just for a fresh infilling of your Holy Spirit, uh, a setting aside to the special ministry that you've called each of these two. And next time, we're going to look at the work of the Holy Spirit in the Old Testament in two men set apart to build the pieces of the tabernacle. And I know you're calling us, Lord, into ministry and faithfulness. So we look forward to that, Lord. We, we anticipate what you're going to do, and we thank you for tonight. If you agree, in Jesus' name, would you say... Amen. Would you stand for the last song?
Amen. Thank you, Lord. Thank you for calling us and setting us apart, consecrating us, making us holy because we're in the Holy One. Practically, you want us to be holy as well. I'm not sure we all realize what we just sang, but we ask for you to refine us and set us apart so we could do your will. And Lord, it is our biggest battle we confess it, full surrender as believers, saying, just do what you want, Lord. <laughs> I'm getting out of the way. It's, it's tough. It's a challenge. And we want to be true to what we have said, Lord, and what we have sung. And I believe that one of the most powerful moments in anyone's life is to finally decide that that's who they want to be. So, Lord, give us the grace that we need. And we're not going to be perfect the moment that we make a declaration. We're not going to just walk out, you know, not failing again. But once we plant our flag, I believe that there's a power in that declaration, in a confession, unashamed, saying, as for me in my house, we will serve the Lord. So thank you for tonight again, Lord. Would you bless each one, uh, each family as they go their way? Please provide traveling mercies and blessings and protection. 
and uh, ongoing uh, overflow to each one, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. We're going to have a time of fellowship in the foyer, so enjoy that. If you need prayer, we'll, we'll be waiting for you at the front.